Well, this week's gospel is the story of Jesus' transfiguration. And Pastor Heidi and I always joke about who gets to preach on this story each year because it is so strange and mysterious that it often leaves a pastor wondering what he or she can possibly say about it. Years ago, I preached a transfiguration sermon called the, A Glimpse of His Glory, and I, I still like that title. For this story is like a brief preview of coming attractions, which show Jesus at a very crucial point in his ministry, revealed in his true heavenly glory. It is absolutely packed with Old Testament imagery. And if you don't know these images and what they are, then the story is even more strange and confusing. By sermon this week, I am going to talk about the symbols and images which help make sense of the Transfiguration story. First off, the timing of the story is important. As we near Lent, we have jumped from chapter 1 in Mark to chapter 9. The story of Transfiguration always sets the stage for Ash Wednesday and Lent. In Mark's Gospel, this story takes place at the very beginning of chapter 9, but chapter 8 ends with something important. Peter's great confession, where for the first time in the Gospel, one of Jesus' disciples declares who Jesus truly is. When Jesus asks his disciples, but who do you say that I am? Peter responds, you are the Messiah. However, Peter then being Peter, blows his moment of insight by yelling at Jesus when Jesus told his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and die. That won't happen, Peter says, and Jesus has to yell at him. Well, after Jesus tells his disciples in very stark words about the cost of discipleship, the story then jumps ahead six days to the transfiguration. On that day, Peter took, or Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him to a high mountain. This is another time when Jesus went off to a secluded spot at a crucial moment in his ministry. I talked about that in my sermon last week. However, this time he does not go to pray. He goes to show his disciples who he truly is. In a brief moment, all sorts of things happen before the stunned gaze of those three disciples. We are told that Jesus is transfigured. The Greek word used is a word we all know. It is the word metamorphosis. It's what happens to a caterpillar when it spins a cocoon and then emerges as a butterfly. A complete physical transformation takes place. That's what happens in this story. First off, Jesus' clothing become dazzling white. And then two figures are suddenly standing there with him, Elijah and Moses, talking with Jesus. Now, how the disciples knew it was Elijah and Moses, we're not told, but that's who it is. Then Peter starts going on about making tents. A cloud overshadows them all, and a voice from heaven declares, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And then, poof, it's all over. All those extras are gone. It's just Jesus and his disciples, his disciples standing with mouths open and eyes bugged out, I would imagine, trying to make sense of what has just happened. So, what had just happened? In that strange, mystifying moment, Jesus was revealed for who he truly was. And all that was done with the symbols from the Old Testament, it's and a rewind to his baptism, tell us who he really was. Again, in my sermon, I'm going to talk about all these symbols, but here's a quick summary. The mountain. Often in the Old Testament, when God appeared to his people, it was on a mountain. The most famous is, of course, Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, where God gave Israel the Ten Commandments. Mountains are important. Dazzling white clothes. Well, we're told in Exodus 39 that when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, having been on the mountain for days in the presence of God, his face shone bright and his skin shone as well, perhaps even shining through his clothing. Such is what happens when one is in the holy presence of the Lord. Elijah. Well, Elijah was one of the great prophets of the Lord in the Old Testament. He stood alone against wicked King Ahab and Queen Jezebel and the 400 priests of the Canaanite god Baal on a mountain. The story of Elijah ends with him being taken into heaven in a fiery chariot. And Jewish tradition, Jewish tradition held that Elijah would return to usher in the coming of the Messiah. In fact, the Old Testament ends with words to this effect. Moses, the greatest prophet and lawgiver of the Old Testament, was also the only human to have ever seen God's true glory. Moses was in the presence of God on the mountain. His appearance on the mountain ties Jesus to God's presence as well. Peter's tents. Now, why would he possibly want to go and build some tents? Well, 
This goes back to the wilderness journey of Israel when the people of Israel lived in tents for those 40 years. In fact, in Jesus' time into today, they still celebrate a festival where they build little tents, little shelters to remember the wilderness wanderings. Peter's confused words tie into what he, to what he has seen with the wilderness wanderings of Israel. The cloud. Clouds are used in the Old Testament to show the presence of God with his people. A cloud led the people of Israel through the wilderness by day. A cloud covered Mount Sinai when Moses was on it receiving the Ten Commandments. And then finally, the voice. The divine voice reminds us of the voice Jesus heard when he came out of the River Jordan following his baptism, a voice which declared, You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Well, as I said, I will go into these symbols and images in more detail in my sermon, but it's important for you to know them and what they mean if we're going to make any sense out of this really puzzling story. So join us at worship on Sunday as I talk about them and what this story still means for us today and why symbols are still important for us as Christians today. Hope to see you in worship on Sunday.